Welcome to a new episode, and in this one, we're gonna be talking about the weird and wacky and wild world of Chinese car design. Until the 1980s, there wasn't even a Chinese car market. It wasn't actually until the 90s when the Chinese market began to grow rapidly. Just 20 years later, the Chinese car market is becoming one of the most fascinating ones in the world and is also doing one of the most interesting things when it comes to the design of electric vehicles. And while copycat designs still exist, Chinese car manufacturers are starting to find their own identity and their own design language. We're gonna analyze the evolution of Chinese car design by breaking it down into three distinct eras. The first era spans from 2000 to 2010, which we'll call the copycat era. The first copycat that we'll look at is one of my designs. This one was released in 2005. It's from a company called Shuang Huang, and the name of the car was the S-C-E-O. On first glance, there's even a danger of me not knowing if this is the BMW X5 or if this is a copycat because they've nailed it. Only a few small distinctions would make you realize it's not the BMW 5, namely the grille, the headlights, taillights, and a few things around the fender area of this car. But also on the side of the vehicle, there's a kick up on the rear glass on the side, which is in the X3, never happened in the X5, and it doesn't really work, I think, in this car here. The wheel housing area, we had a lot more of a dynamic approach there when I did it. Here, it's become very generic. The rear taillight graphic is very BMW-esque, but again, it doesn't work with the front headlight. If you ever saw this car on the road and said it was the X5, I would not blame you. I would not, uh, I I'd completely understand. <laughs> But the game doesn't end there. They've also released a car called the Little Noble. Forget BMW. I mean, I don't see a BMW this. I see a first gen smart car as close as you could get to a car looking like that first gen smart. A few things are different, but it overall, if you saw this at first glance and thought it was a smart, you'd definitely be forgiven for that. And moving on, I really want to highlight the identity crisis that the Chinese car company were running in that first decade of 2000. To ram it home, let's look at the 2008 Leaf On 320. Now this one is quite obviously a Mini. Now I can remember some of the earlier sketches I did when I was developing the theme for the new Mini. And this one definitely looks like one of the rougher ideas I had when returning home after a, a long night out with my pals and having few too many drinks. It's kind of like the twin brother and, and wasn't the most beautiful of the twins, although he does have great genetics. He just ended up on the, uh, uh, something's wrong with him. Now that era must have been quite painful for them as designers because they weren't relying on their own creative ideation, but instead relying on cars that were obviously successful and that they didn't mind bringing back to life with a new name and a slight variation. Look at that 2003 Geely Beauty Leopard. I mean, my first thought was this is a Supra. Nope. Then we look at the 2006 BYD S8. Take that first front view. My gosh, how could you not think that is coming off of an SL, Mercedes-Benz SL, SLK. Walk around the car, come to the back, you're staring at a Renault Megane. However, this car marked a turning point. This car, specifically this one, was boycotted even by the Chinese media as being too similar to the Mercedes SL and in the rear to the Megane. So that suddenly made them sit up and realize that a new direction in Chinese car design was indeed necessary. This then ushered the Chinese car market into its next era from 2010 to 2020, the developing era. As we can see from the cars in the developing era, some Chinese car manufacturers wanted to learn from their mistakes and some quality models, some were made. 
And so we begin again with a copycat. In 2015, a brand called Landwind, and I'll give you a few seconds. Quite clearly, they decided to copy the Land Rover Evoque. The design similarities are so strikingly similar that Land Rover had no other option, were forced almost to sue Landwind. And guess who won? And justice was served, not only for Land Rover, but also for the Chinese consumer who for so long had been longing for originality in Chinese car design. This desire was backed up in 2016 when Zotier released their SR9. And again, incredibly, this is just a ripoff of the Porsche Macan. While a few of them did sell, most of the Chinese people hated this car. And then Zoite, the company making this car, went bankrupt. But there was one company, Cherry, who actually decided to do something quite a bit more original, quite a bit distinct from any other car out there. And who did they turn to? Pininfarina who, for those of you who don't know, are an iconic styling house who've worked with many manufacturers in the past. And the car that they then released was the Cherry A3, which when you look at it, could be easily confused with any number of cars on European roads today. So again, perhaps distinct in a sense that it didn't copy any existing designs, not really expressing what we would say is a Chinese type of design language. Now the car doesn't scream uniqueness, as I said, it doesn't scream unique character or anything like that. I think it's basically just almost generic type looking car, but having a no brand appeal is probably significantly more desirable than having a copycat appeal. So this car did pretty well on the market when it was sold. In 2016, there was a definite shift to try to get something original on the market, the Trump Chi. GS8. This is their flagship SUV. You would perhaps pick up a few elements that you could say you've seen before, but not so much with an intent to be an absolute copycat of an existing model. Those are a few perhaps extreme examples to show that there was a desire within the Chinese car culture to develop something, a design language that was distinctly their own. Now, since 2020, Chinese car manufacturers have entered a new era of car design. And we'll start by looking first at the BYD Han and the BYD Dolphin. Now, BYD used to be one of the original copycat companies. Now, thanks to Chinese designers, global designers, all of them working together, They've got their own family design language, and most importantly, their sales have been leading the Chinese car market. The Han came from the highly successful BYD EC GT concept. The EC GT concept, as you can see, is quite unique, quite sensual, definitely a GT sports car, has that, that feeling of being, let's call it a sedan, let's call it a sports car, halfway between there, but quite distinctive, very nice looking, almost distinctive in a certain way. And I can see the reason why something like this would be successful in the market. And then moving on to the Dolphin, this again is quite distinctive. I wouldn't call it pretty in any sense of the word, but unique is for sure a word I would use here. Something that a lot of Chinese owners would be looking for, something that has its own individual character. And then the next one, Geely. Geely again is one of the original copycat companies. And the O3, which we'll look at here, the O3 Plus, is what they call their performance saloon. And this is almost a, a motorsport version of the O3 that won the FIA TCR, WTCR World Championship. The car is what it is. It's a very, very sporty four-door saloon car. The headlights, front of the car, again, very, very unique, sort of a race car with a registration plate on it. Another quite fresh new design for the Chinese market comes from the company called Honki. And this is what they call the L5. There's the L5, the H9, and the S9. Now this car marks something quite unique for the Chinese market, simply by knowing that their design department is being led 
by x Roll's chief designer, head designer, Giles Taylor. That means that he's bringing a lot of influence to their company. They've been developing also an S9 concept, which is a very, very sporty car. The design actually by Walter Da Silva. Also, I know it's, I think, being engineered by Amadeo Feliza, one of the guys I've always looked up to in terms of engineering. And then also their large saloon type car called the L5. I wouldn't call it distinctive design because it looks fairly, well, I hate the word retro. Let's call it nostalgic. Lots of chrome, very serious, almost mafia-esque or gangster style cars. Very suited to that market because it has distinction and uh, definitely a feeling of luxury. The H9, again, that is another car from them, which is doing the job of representing what a luxury car could look like. This car, namely from the first impression when you look at it from the front, recalls quite a bit of the direction of a Bentley, for example. Very majestic, nice and slab-sided, almost on the side, which gives you a feeling a little bit with the two-tone of a Maybach. Two-tone paint always seems to elevate the luxury of a car. But what I think is most interesting of all these is probably the best-selling car in China. And we're gonna be speaking about the Wuling Hongguang Mini EV and the Cabrio. And what's really interesting is that they've managed to keep the price extremely low. And when I say the price extremely low, I'm talking about the price of three iPhones. So around 4,000, uh, would that be dollars or... Uh, and the appreciation for that price point is what has led them to outsell Tesla in electric vehicle sales worldwide. So that is proof positive that they've done something correct and done well. Even though there is a definite shift towards adding distinction and, and character and personality, sadly, they haven't been able to completely separate themselves from the copycat industry. And the best example of that today is a car called the Aura Cat. Now, this car has drawn quite a bit of criticism from the outside markets simply because it looks quite a bit like a Porsche. And if you think that the Aura Cat looks derivative, take a look at the Aura Punk Cat and if you don't know what this car looks like, then you're not really into cars. This isn't the Volkswagen Beetle, but it kind of looks like the Beetle. And it wouldn't surprise me if this ended in a lawsuit as well. And finally, the last one, the 2021 Great Wall Mecca Dragon. Now this is a difficult one because I'm having a hard time understanding if this is really a serious proposal. There are a few things controversial. First of all, the name really throws me off. Mecha Dragon kind of harks back to the old video games, the retro video games. But again, if you look at the design of this car, it's a bit heavy handed. It definitely looks like cars were modeled before when we did polygon modeling and you didn't take it much further. You ended up with designs that look quite a bit like this. There is a similarity, slight similarity to Nissan 350Z. I've never seen a car designed like this before. If it's successful, it won't be, let's call it successful in high numbers, but just in becoming something very unique on the market. Now, the problem with uniqueness is, is it's not hard to design a unique looking car. The hard part is to design something that is unique and desirable. And finally, the Neo EP9, which is a car I actually went to the launch of when it was presented here in London. Beautiful looking car. Congratulations, Dave. David, you know who I'm talking about. And this car set actually the fastest time around the Nürburgring as an electric car. Amazingly high performance. This car can strike fear in the heart of its competitors. Looks fantastic, performs extremely well. And this car, again, if we ever see it in the light of day as a production car, I'm sure will be incredibly successful and shows actually what Chinese car companies are capable of doing. So in just 20 short years, Chinese car manufacturers have gone from copycat to some truly amazing and original designs. So I think it's important to let you know that as a disclaimer, this has nothing to do with any Chinese car company, any Chinese affiliation at all. It's just a statement on my behalf of what I feel 
about the moving trend of car design in China. We do have a Chinese YouTube channel. We have a lot of viewers in China, but this is also for them to see, and for them to enjoy a little bit of my input dedicated to their market. If you're a car enthusiast, you'll be seeing some great stuff coming out from China. I do think that the Chinese car market over the last 20 years has actually been a fascinating story to, to witness, to be a part of, to see it happening in front of our eyes. And I think that in itself merits a bit of a design story, a bit of a design critique about where they started, where they are, and where they're going. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.